and we are live. Liam, please take it away. Okay, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so welcome to the new Center for Research and Practices uh, public session uh, with our programmers. So uh, the new center is a para-academic institution that offers uh, cutting edge seminars on art, philosophy, and uh, humanities in general. Within it, uh, we have four certificate programs, uh, each of them led by one of our programmers. So there's uh, transdisciplinary studies uh, led by Jason Mahagig, critical philosophy run by Reza Negristani, art and curatorial practices run by uh, Cecile Malaspina, and finally, history, design, and world making by Thomas Moynihan. Okay, so uh, aside from the programmers and uh, the organizer, we also have Raphael here with us. Um, Raphael is responsible for our student services at the new center and uh, will answer some frequently asked uh, questions and respond to any queries you might have about the process. Uh, and this will happen all uh, towards the end of uh, the session. Uh, my name is Liam Sibari. I'm the social co social media coordinator here at the New Center. Uh, I've also published a piece with the New Center last year. It was called uh, The Narcissist Image. I did my MA in art history at the American University of Beirut and my master's degree in cultural studies uh, at KU Leuven in Belgium. So I'm really happy to be here uh, moderating this uh, public session, uh, which supports the applicants and uh, as some of you may know, applications for the certificate programs are currently open. Um, and there's the possibility of receiving full uh, and partial scholarships. And so if you're considering applying, uh, this is a great chance for you to get to know the new center uh, as an institution, to meet the programmers, and also know more about the upcoming seminars. So again, here with me, I have Rafael Muscardi our student services representative. So Raphael, please uh, take it away. Uh, okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Liam. Uh, as, uh, yes. uh, as you mentioned, I am the responsible for student services and uh, just about the application process, uh, while you're applying, if you're applying for a scholarship, please ensure that you include a cover letter and a writing sample, which showcase your intellectual interests and, clar and clarifies your need for financial relief uh, in the program. So applicants from the Global South, as we always uh, we always do, will be automatically considered for 50% scholarships. And currently half of our full scholarship recipients are actually from the Global South and half of them are women as well. Uh, this year, uh, in particular, building on our successful fundraising campaigns uh, in the past that we have supported Ukrainian and Iranian students in 2022 and 2023, we're introducing a project-based initiative in response to the Gaza-Israel conflict and in support of an immediate ceasefire. And uh, following also the success of our workshops in the past uh, in the past seasons and in the past year in particular, uh, we will also be having a quite general uh, workshop by Valentin Golev, who will teach a workshop titled uh, GPT for Arts and Humanities, which will be focused on customizing AI tools for text-based research, and it is accessible and it is will be made accessible to everybody regardless of uh, their previous knowledge in programming. And uh, it will be a way eight session workshop that focuses on the text-based research in humanities uh, and leverages LLM technologies, so large, large language models, particularly ChatGPT and GPT-4 and uh, equips participants with knowledge about key LLM technologies and products such as ChatGPT, GPT API, vector embeddings, and uh, also support other broad range of useful applications for LLM that will be useful for researchers within the arts and humanities, such as the construction of topic-specific chatbots, techniques for analyzing expansive PDF archives, as well as innovative uh, conceptual uh, approaches to conceptual research, and translation. Thank you, Leon. Okay, thank you, Raphael. Uh, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about the new center. Uh, so the new center for research and practice is an international nonprofit higher education institution. We work uh, in the arts, humanities, and sciences. We offer graduate and professional development level certificate programs, workshops, seminars, exhibitions, residencies, and conferences in the fields of arts and uh, curatorial practices. 
critical philosophy, transdisciplinary studies, and our newly announced uh, program, history design and world making. Okay, so by uh, studying at the new center, uh, students practice uh, graduate and professional level uh, research in a manner that does not interrupt their existing artistic, academic, or professional aspirations, but instead uh, complements, enhances, and intensifies them. If you're interested in knowing more about us, uh, our programs, and our upcoming seminars and workshops, you can check out our YouTube channel or access uh, our website, thenewcenter.org. And if you have any questions that might not be answered uh, within this presentation, uh, you could always write them in the YouTube chat so we can read them afterwards. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce uh, our programs. Uh, okay. Okay, so we have our uh, transdisciplinary studies program led by Jason Mahagig. It explores literature, poetry, anthropology, psychoanalysis, cultural studies, media theory, the arts, science, design, and uh, vernacular knowledge. Uh, by engaging with strategies that capture complexity, cultivate new ecologies of knowledge, and uh, affect individual and collective transformations. The program can be considered as a sort of alternative to cultural studies or uh, comparative literature. Jason Bobek Mahagek is an associate professor of uh, comparative literature at Babson College. His scholarly focus uh, is upon tracking currents of experimental thought between the Middle East and the West. With particular attention to concepts of chaos, violence, illusion, silence, madness, futurism, disappearance, and apocalyptic aesthetics. He has published several books to date, including The Chaotic Imagination, New Literature and Philosophy in the Middle East with uh, Palgrave Macmillan, the Radical Unspoken, Silence in Middle Eastern and Western Thought with Rutledge, Night, A Philosophy of the After Dark with Zero Books, uh, as well as Omnicides uh, 1 and 2 with MIT Press, Urbanomic, and Sequence. Uh, Jason, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's wonderful to see everyone. Uh, transdisciplinary uh, studies program, this term, uh, we must have all been silently or surreptitiously influenced by uh, Tarkovsky's stalker, film stalker, because it seems like we're all interested in uh, exploring different elements of the idea of the zone. You know, the zone in, in the film stalker, for those who haven't seen, is a, is a troubling, disquieting, mysterious place that is most likely fatal for all those who enter. But if you can survive it, uh, you learn the secrets of the universe. Uh, so... Uh, it seems like everyone seems uh, appears to be in, in those trajectories. The first uh, individual that is teaching for us in transdisciplinary, I'm very honored that she's joined our ranks, uh, Professor Joelle McSweeney. She's a professor of literature at uh, University of Notre Dame, a very renowned poet, playwright, uh, theorist, uh, uh, literary theorist. And she's going to be taking to the next level a theme that she's developed for for years in her own research in captivating ways on the idea of the necropastoral, which she describes as an eco-aesthetic, you know, and obviously she's also a, a, an amazing poet and writer on themes of death and of loss. Uh, so she's interested in this eco-aesthetic zone, which she describes as, quote, decadent, inverted, unfit, too much, anachronistic, posthumous, and full of ill-founded and spectacular affects. Right. So we're going, she's going into sort of very low, intriguing territories where there are hybrid life forms, uh, vegetal and angelic languages, insect languages uh, that can be looked at, issues of wildness, obviously, when you're dealing with the necropastoral, uh, underworlds, all sorts of, all sorts of uh, fascinating things that, uh, that she's interested in, bird languages, shamanism, cosmic transit, this is all in four weeks' time climatology, geology, and ecologies of repetition, omenology and contradiction. These are all, again, uh, elements that she's constructed of this territory, conceptual territory that she calls the necropastoral, and the authors of the necropastoral, poets and writers who she thinks are precisely embedded in that kind of territorial imagination. Um, from there, we have uh, coming back to join us because he's such a Phenomenal instructor, Will Scarlett, 
uh, who did his doctoral research, uh, completed it last year, did his doctoral research at the New School University on, he's an anthropologist on anthropologies of the virtual, though, and he's really at the cutting edge of those issues because anthropology is just now flirting at the borderlines of doing kind of uh, virtual anthropology. And what he's interested in, probably it's an emanation of his looking at virtual and, and metaversal realms. Uh, he's interested in a, I mean, the name of the class is being there and not there. So he's interested in this strange spatiality uh, that uh, the Chilean writer, he says, Roberto Bolaño calls uh, the melancholy folklore of exile. But he has a quote from Bolaño that begins that he says, I had practically no friends and all I did was ride and go for long walks starting at seven in the evening, just after getting up with a feeling like jet lag, an odd sensation of fragility, of being there and not there somehow distant from my surroundings. So what Will Scarlett wants to do, Dr. Scarlett, he wants to examine this sensation of the being there and not there, uh, how that plays with ideas of presence and absence, uh, how that sort of melts the borderlines of identity and of experience. And he's going to look at it through four lenses. The week one is on the immaterial, week two, the elemental, week three, the synesthetic, and week four, the multiple. And he has an unbelievable uh, list of individuals that he wants to read sort of in, that, in those sessions to explore the being there and not there. Uh, from there we have, uh, I've stolen one of, one of Reza's uh, ringers, Daniel Sassilodo, uh, who typically teaches in the, in the critical philosophy program, but he's devised a very intriguing seminar this term uh, on universalism in Latin American thought. And what he's particularly interested in is the utopian tradition of the 20th century in Latin America that started to look at that localized region as a potential port of departure, uh, point of departure for a more global horizon of intellectual discourse, of science, of art, of politics. Uh, and he's intrigued by those trajectories that experimented with Latin America as a a potential utopia and a univer form of universalism, which obviously is dislocated from the European centers that are part of the colonial imagination. So he's going to look at issues of cosmopolitanism, issues of cultural synthesis. Um, he's going to look at what humanism does in so-called third worlds uh, or sort of uh, beyond the center. Uh, he's re reading amazing uh, philosophers of liberation theory, decolonial uh, philosophers as well. Uh, looking at the precursors to sort of decolonial theory and the decolonial turn, and then ending with figures like Gabriel Catrin and Kantian transcendentalism and other things like that, contemporary provocative sort of philosophical paradigms to see how it plays out in conversation with that Latin American universalist tradition. And then on my side, the fourth and final seminar, I decided that it's been a long time that I've been interested in the mystery cults of the ancient world. Um, not, not so much in researching them, but more in resurrecting them, if possible. So, <laughs> so for our seminar, uh, I'm running it again, somewhat like a, a laboratory, an experimental interactive laboratory where the seminar takers themselves go on a scavenger hunt each week and come back with case studies of secret societies, cults, undergrounds, uh, outsider movements uh, that use, use techniques of encryption, concealment, camouflage, uh, subterranean or exilic movements. Ultimately, what I want us to do is build a philosophy of secrecy and even more importantly, a philosophy of conspiracy uh, throughout the semester and to understand that. And so in our four weeks, we're going to follow the, the ancient Greek terms of the mystery cults Hierophantis, the revealer, because these were four roles in every mystery cult. The revealer, Daduchos, the torchbearer, Mr. Gogos, the accomplice, and Mistes, the initiate. So we'll get into the roles and where the masks and veils of each one of those four, and we'll try to see if we can turn the new center into our own mystery cult for, for a few weeks at a time. And that's the transdisciplinary story that's going to unfold. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, so next up, we have history design and uh, world making. So, uh, working on the productive collision between design, architecture, and philosophy, this program recognizes the historical roots of design and architecture and how various philosophies and theories 
shape these disciplines. And uh, this program is led by Thomas Moynihan. Thomas is a UK-based writer, holds a doctorate in philosophy from Oriel College, Oxford, and is currently a visiting researcher at uh, Cambridge University Center for the Study of Existential Risk. His motivating interests include how attitudes uh, towards temporality have uh, changed throughout time. That is how beliefs about the about deep history and the further future have become more capacious or how people have across the ages um, gradually discovered just how far the horizon of consequences uh, seems to extend through space and time. So yeah, I'll let uh, Thomas take over from here. Thank you, Liam. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, good. I was having some uh, some rather frustrating Zoom issues earlier, but uh, it seems like everything's a-okay now. Um, great. So I put together some slides. So let me just share my screen. Great. So uh, history, design, and world making, the uh, second, second semester that we've uh, been uh, doing this program. Uh, and I'm really excited. There's some amazing stuff to come uh so i just wanted to very briefly um give some sense of what i see the course as doing um so i want to start with one of my favorite quotes which i'm sure you're all very familiar with uh from wilford sellers so he in the 60s defined philosophy um thus he said the aim of philosophy abstractly formulated is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. Uh, and this is a quote that I keep uh, returning to. It's deceptively simple. So I would argue that one important way in which things hang together is how the things which came before influence the things which come afterward. Uh, another word that we use for this is history. History is important because it is the record of actions that mattered, that made a difference. Uh, moving forwards, if we want our actions to matter in the right ways, we therefore need to study history. It is also the medium through which we recognize the events that made us what and who we are, in the important sense attached to acknowledgement that had these events gone differently, then our present would also be different, potentially to the point of being unrecognizable. Only by coming to terms with this do we alert ourselves to those actions happening in our present, which, by the same token, are leaving their marks on the future and influencing its course, making certain possibilities manifest and prohibiting others. This way, history is therefore also the arena of design, uh, in the sense that it is the arena wherein we decide and curate which worlds are made manifest and which worlds we come to occupy, from the far vaster range of all those totally plausible and possible. So this is why I'm trying to hang together these, uh, these words, history, design, and world making. Thanks to centuries of inquiry into this universe and its workings, we now understand that this arena of the historical, of the consequential, of the influential, extends far beyond our own biographies and the familiar scales of human life, bookended by birth and death. We are all fluent with historical concepts when it comes to our own individual lives. Uh, for example, I recognize that if I injure myself seriously, I may never walk again. Uh, because I also acknowledge that this isn't inevitable, I endeavor to avoid it. But now that human industry has become a planet shaping force, our societies must now become adept at applying such historical concepts like contingency or irreversibility far beyond our biographies to extending scales from the social to the geological to the planetary. Um, for better or worse, our history has led us to become world makers in this way. The question for the coming epoch is whether our societies can wield such power in ways that make them matters of wisdom, foresight or design, rather than matters of haphazardness, accident or corruption which is in some ways the way in which they've predominantly been colored so far. Through its courses, this program therefore aims to explore these questions uh, and many other related ones when it comes to these contemporary questions of world making, history and design, as I just attempted to spell out there. So onto the courses. So the first one we've got is uh, Earthworks and Water Power 
uh, by the brilliant Colin Drum. Uh, so this seminar investigates the history of state power in relation to the organization and financing of earthworks for irrigation and flood control. Since Whitfogel, earthworks and the administration of hydraulic infrastructure have been enlisted to elaborate the Marxian category of oriental despotism by means of which the supposed stagnation of non-Western state societies could be explained. This seminar, therefore, will begin by examining this literature before moving on to more contemporary scholarship on the deep history of hydraulic engineering and its relationship to money, the state, and the social processes of risk management. Water is both a necessary condition for life and a powerful and unpredictable threat. How have different societies responded to the need to manage their exposure to water and what constraints have this need posed for their organizations, governance structures and built environments. Um, I'm really excited about this one. It's, uh, it's a capacious but original um, uh, take on a topic, I think. Uh, and so next we've got uh, From Infer Inference to Intervention uh, by Magdalena Christoforska. Uh, in recent decades, uh, machine learning methods have become deeply entangled with processes of world making. Uh, when deployed in contexts such as criminal justice, social welfare, or public health, predictive systems take an even more active role in shaping the world by directly feeding data-driven insights into decision-making processes. In such high-stakes contexts, patterns generalized from observed data are rendered actionable, often embedding and exacerbating historical patterns of inequality and social harm. The project of remaking the world in a way that does not encode the past into the future in a perpetual feedback loop of discrimination requires an in-depth examination of the operative logics underlying some of the key machine learning methods operationalized in high stakes contexts. This seminar, therefore, will explore some of the key concepts and example components of machine learning systems by situating them in their implementation contexts and examining their epistemic functions. Uh, I'm also very excited about this. Magdalena's just finished a PhD in machine learning, uh, so this proves to be very deep and insightful. Uh, next, we have Abducting the Future uh, by Sam Forsyth, which was planned for last semester, but uh, had to be delayed until this one. Um, this, again, I'm really excited about this. Uh, very excited to see it finally, finally, uh, finally take place. Uh, so Sam's description says, this seminar will look at the logic of inquiry in the history of strategic thought, exploring the role of abductive inference and anticipatory practices in key discourses of strategic rationality with the aim of elucidating their significance for military political logics of the present. From ancient warfare and Renaissance statecraft to modern strategy and global intelligence throughout history, a key aim of those engaged in political conflict has been to detect, anticipate and shape future events by inferring possibilities, designing plans and pursuing actions despite danger, chance and uncertainty. Across the four sessions of this seminar, pragmatist Persian tools will be used to read both major and minor works from the history of strategic thought, finding new and critical ways to read texts on ancient Greek and Chinese warfare, early modern statecraft, Napoleonic and industrial age strategy, and present day practices of military futurality and global intelligence. Again, this uh, hopefully proves to be a sprawling and sweeping and masterful course. And I'm very excited to see it finally taking place. Uh, and so penultimately we have um, World Making Between Prometheanism and Perspectivism by Jose Antonio Macales and Luisa Crosman. The goal of this seminar is to treat the question of planetary design at the often polemical intersection of two contemporary streams of thought. On one side, perspectivism, cosmopolitics and or the ontological turn, and on the other, Prometheanism, neo-rationalism and or left accelerationism. This is structured on the basis of Eduardo de Castro's text on models and examples, bricolers and engineers of the Anthropocene, where he articulates a critique of geoengineering through the Levi-Straussian distinction between bricolers who work with examples and engineers who work with models. Drawing from tensions within de Castro's own text, we will avoid simple oppositions 
whilst attempting to learn something from the perspectivist critique of geoengineering and the Promethean elaboration of planetary scale world making. Um, again, this, this uh, seminar proves to be provocative uh, and uh, very interesting. So I'm looking forward to this one too. And finally, uh, we have uh, 200 years of life from the ever brilliant Ben Woodard. Uh, this two part seminar um, will track the history, politics and philosophy of biology over the course of the last 200 years since biology cohered as a scientific discipline. We will attempt to break out of two critical dead ends in interpreting biology. These dead ends are as follows. On the one hand, various political and historical limitations in analytic treatments of biology, and on the other, disregard for biological history and scientific detail in continental philosophical discourses around the life sciences. So Ben's hoping to bring a more synoptic, uh, post-continental, post-analytic view here, I believe. Um, so this is a, a two-part seminar, uh, so eight sessions. So this is gonna be the first four in this semester. Uh, and this will take us from Aristotle and Kant through to Darwin and Galton, all the way to the Bone Wars, the so-called Eclipse of Darwinism, to Neo-Lamarckianism and the formation of the modern synthesis. Uh, so again, this is going to be sprawling and sweeping. Uh, ben has a, a, a unparalleled grip on this material. And so I would really advise students to be, uh, to, to, try to take up this course. Uh, and that is all, uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, super. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so next we have uh, Critical Philosophy under Reza Nigaristani. So uh, this program is uh, devoted to uh, developing philosophy adequate to addressing uh, the problems uh, posed by the 21st century. Uh, mainly the necessary transformation of concepts of reason and thought uh, as they pertain to the development of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, automation. Reza Negaristani is a philosopher. He has contributed extensively to several journals and uh, anthologies and lectured at numerous international universities and institutions. His current philosophical project is focused on rationalist universalism, beginning with the evolution of the modern system of knowledge and advancing towards contemporary philosophies of rationalism, their procedures, as well as their demands for special forms of human conduct. He is the author of Cyclonopedia and Intelligence and Spirit. Take it away, Reza. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And hello. Um, so, uh, I mean, I don't have uh, that many words uh, to add uh, to make this semester, the upcoming semester, more interesting than what it is and all these great Pro uh, seminars being presented in other programs. Uh, I remember uh, when the new center contacted me uh, a few years ago when I became uh, the programmer uh, of critical philosophy. Um, um, I, I agreed to this uh, precisely because uh, it looked uh, fundamentally a great project. And in, in an intriguing one, it had potentials in the sense that it was uh, it, it, the the selling line to me was that you know this is a this is a program that not only uh, essentially goes deep into the history of philosophy and creates introduction and highly specific sort of seminars about the uh, historical philosophical questions. But also, in a way, uh, the program, uh, this philosophy program, uh, has the characteristics of always venturing out, always trying to essentially synchronize uh, the idea of philosophy, uh, philosophy or philosophical uh, conduct uh, with what is outside of philosophy, like and. Uh, this this was a fundamentally intriguing idea back then, and especially now today, even more so. That uh, this is one of those uh, programs of philosophy that genuinely, uh, for the first time, I would say, 
ventures out and uh, there are seminars in the relations between philo critical philosoph philosophy and computer science, cybernetics, uh, political organization, money, um, you name it, uh, right? Uh, the sort of, you know, kind of transdisciplinary uh, ideas, but also more than tr just transdisciplinary uh, or interdisciplinarity, uh, that uh, essentially it, it sells an idea of philosophy, uh, which I would say is proper to our age, whereby philosophy engages uh, what is other than philosophy, right? The outside of philosophy, uh, not merely as interesting ideas to be entertained, but rather as ideas that for philosophy to move forward, it should seriously incorporate them and engage with them in complete sincerity. So this uh, semester, I thought about this. Okay, how about this? That's, uh, you know, we, we crystallize this. And of course we have always been doing it, but this particular uh, semester, upcoming semester has, has, a, has a kind of a different aura about it, precisely because it's explicitly programmed uh, around uh, incorporating and serious engagement with the outside of philosophy, the other of philosophy, the, the impurity dimension, right? But of course, as always, according to the mission of the new center, uh, we have to, uh, you know, give certain sort of updated accounts of uh, historical philosophical questions. And so for that matter, the semester actually captures uh, both of these, uh, you know, in tandem with uh, the mission of critical philosophy at the new center. So for this uh, semester, uh, first, we have uh, the seminar by our great instructor, um, who is now a core of the new center, uh, uh, critical philosophy program, uh, Jean-Pierre Carroll, uh, on the sissiparity of Geist, reason and its outsides. Um, well, the whole po point, uh, the, there is this book uh, called Reason and Its Other by uh, Dieter Frontlip. And it, uh, it is actually a, a fundamentally historic, great historical document about why is that Post-World War II, uh, for example, German philosophy shows a uh, fundamental uh, kind of enmity or hostility towards certain uh, types of philosophy of rationality or, or reason, the idea of reason, right, after the World War II in Germany. Uh, a uh, hostility that uh, once generalized, once amplified, becomes hostility toward the reason and its implications. And Jean-Pierre, uh, J.P. Caron, uh, essentially, I would say, uh, his seminar is in the vein of this, uh, you know, very problem. Uh, Post World War II Germany. Uh, which spread out, uh, you know, to other sort of uh, you know, regions in Europe, and ultimately uh, became global. Um, 
the, the uh, seminar uh, is centered on um, a great um, piece written by our uh, recent instructor, Ilan Ben Susan, Geist and Gestel, Beyond the Cyber Nihilist Convergence of Intelligence. And the whole point uh, uh, is that of, of sissiparity thesis, uh, if I'm not reductively you know, formulating it, uh, it's, a, it's a response to certain uh, trends in contemporary philosophy, including no rationalism, right? Uh, and particularly, uh, what might come off as a thesis uh, of the work that I have written, uh, Intelligence and a Spirit. So Elon uh, argues uh, quite briefly that, you know, uh, that this uh, Sissiparity thesis uh, is essentially um, a form of inherent and divergent tendency within the edifice of reason itself whereby one can say different forms of geister separate and become unintelligible for each other. In terms of Ben Susan's uh, thesis, geist B cannot have any contact, uh, content from the point of view of geist A, because there is no pairing of commands that could be sanctioned by the community geist A. In other words, from the point of view of geist A, those commanded by guys B are obeying to no command whatsoever, even if there is a regularity that can be detected. I mean, within the uh, seemingly benevolent argument, uh, you know, uh, put forward here, there lies a fundamental uh, challenge. And this challenge is that uh, the thesis about, you know, kind of like the, you know, the end game of reason, what you might say, ultimately <clears throat> results in a certain sort of excessive forcing, for, sorry, excessive forking of intelligent trajectories, of geists, whereby these forks, which have been forked excessively, can no longer recognize one, one other, each other, as reasons, right? And of course, um, uh, the you know the connections with David Roden's work uh, is quite you know palpable here uh, in terms of this connection thesis. And so uh, JP's seminar uh, is essentially uh, uh, complete explorations of Elon Ben Susan's premise, but rather taking it to a completely different way, which would be a fundamental response and a challenge to what you might call to be the argument from the sissiparity of reason in terms of Elon Ben Susan's. So um, then I have, in tandem with you know, covering the historical ideas uh, in, in philosophy, but in a rather more updated sense, I have uh, this seminar called uh, Cartesian Conflagrations. And the term uh, Cartesian uh, conflagration is coming from a very obscure book, but a fundamentally magnificent one uh, written in 1957 by Rosalie uh, Coley called Light and Enlightenment. And it attends uh, to essentially uh, the rather murderous or rather pyrotechnical nature of the Cartesian project. Hence Cartesian conflagration that what Descartes 
initiated in philosophy was more like akin to a great blaze that no matter how much you add water to it, it actually tends this fire to grow even more to the point that it reaches Hobbes, it reaches Spinoza, and it fundamentally lays waste to the legacy of a scholasticism as we know it, but in fundamentally twisted ways, right? It's one of those great horror stories that we tell each other in at night about the history of philosophy, and that's what makes his philosophy interesting. Uh, so yes, so the, the, the seminar uh, deals with uh, the Cartesian legacy, and I'm particularly interested not in the sort of boogeyman that Descartes is usually being introduced, right? The body and mind sort of dualist, uh, substance, uh, sub, sub, substance dualism and so on and so forth. But I'm rather more interested in a period where Descartes, by all definitions in Europe, was considered a persona non grata. Uh, this is a period where, having gone through the metaphysical rationalist phase, he now enters a form of softened, some softened and tempered by the greatest insights of empiricism and naturalism. And uh, so in this seminar, I will talk about uh, rather the weight of this sort of uh, Leuven period of Descartes on the end game of the infinite ongoing rationalist empiricist war, but also its impacts on artificial general intelligence, so on and so forth. And uh, third course uh, would be uh, by our great instructor, uh, Anna Longo, on the destruction of life in the epoch of the fourth industrial revolution in formation, anti-production and the ecological crises. So, The subtitle of Anna's course uh, is borrowed uh, from Gunther Anders' uh, subtitle, uh, second volume, uh, the, outdate, the, outdate, the Outdatedness of Human Beings, Under Destruction of Life in the Epoch of the Third Industrial Revolution. And what Anna is trying to to uh, essentially uh, frame here and uh, penetrate the issue is something that uh, Anders has been, uh, you know, um, proposing, you know, in, in basically in the context of the third industrial revolution as, and, and this, rather unnerving complicity, not complicity in a, in a conscious sort of way, but rather an undercurrent uh, inherent correlation between uh, technological proliferation of efficiency, which can be used positively and the complete annihilative powers of technologies. And in Anna's case, which would be the fourth industrial revolution, that would be digital technologies. So through this sort of under current correlation uh, between uh, what is usually being taken to be the benevolent side, which, and the one which is supposed to be the unconscious malevolent side, the annihilative powers, uh, we are always being implicated, right? If, so uh, 
technology in that sense creates a moral paradox. Where its users, uh, particularly, you know, uh, from the third industrial revolution uh, and now the fourth one, are implicated uh, both in, you know, certain sort of collaborative uh, projects in the optimiz optimization of the means of production, but also, uh, strangely enough, uh, a fundamental increase in the risk of annihilation. Right, which usually manifest in uh, rather accumulation, exponential accumulation of damages and inequalities on a daily basis. <clears throat> so this is Anna's uh, course, and uh, I would say that Anna's seminar uh, in this semester is a fundamentally interesting uh uh, I would say, surprising uh, seminar in terms of its content, uh, at least for me personally. And uh, last, uh, so when I mentioned at the beginning uh, that, you know, uh, I thought that it would be great to make explicit this relation of philosophy with its other with the impure dimension, with, uh, with certain sort of themes that often being derided by philosophers as just interesting perspectives, but rather not proper philosophical topics, yet at the end of the day should in fact be engaged as truly philosophical topics would be Kirsten Fuchs. Uh, course on feminism. Feminism in the canon of philosophy, a research lab. So I know Kirsten um, personally. She is an artist, uh, a philosopher, and a staunch, and most probably one of the best, most astute feminist thinkers I have ever had the privilege uh, to talk to. So Kirsten uh, seminar is essentially uh, kind of curated around the, the idea of uh, Judith Butler's um, understanding of philosophy's other uh, the other here being somehow uh, at the very least for now, uh, being uh, po po posited as the other in the sense of traditional understanding of philosophy. That, yes, that, you know, uh, there would be a feminist thinker in a philosophy department, usually the, the, uh, the philosopher analytic department or kind of the philosopher, uh, philosophy department, as we know, mostly consists of uh, men who say that, well, you know, this is an interesting perspective, right, uh, to, to, a to a feminist who is actually in the Department of Philosophy, but rather this is not really philosophy, right? Except that Kirsten wants to fundamentally put an end to this rather shoddy idea by arguing that no, for philosophy to really get mobilized, to find its emancipatory vectors, it ought to include the impure dimension, not merely as an interesting perspective, but really as a serious engine of philosophy. Thank you so much. Okay, super. Thank you, Reza. 
All right. So lastly, we have uh, Art and Curatorial, Curatorial Practices, which is run by Cecil Maraspina. Uh, so the program starts with the recognition that the people enrolled are artists, curators, publishers, editors, and uh, writers who have uh, basically, you know, they have skin in the game of art. And uh, it fosters uh, an emancipatory turn in the context of global digitization and climate chaos from overall lament to a uh, particular investigation of the possibilities for art in the long run. Cecile is the author of An Epistemology of Noise and the principal translator of uh, Gilbert Simondon's uh, On the Mode of Existence of Technical Objects with the uh, collaboration of uh, John Rogo. Sorry if I butchered that. Uh, she is the director de program at the uh, Collège International de Philosophie in Paris. Uh, so yeah, Cecile, please take it over. Hi. Oh, I'm I'm glad that I got the chance to listen to everyone else first. Um, I want to say first of all that um, it's a really great pleasure. It continues to be a real pleasure to work with such brilliant people uh, in the company in the context of all these exciting projects and seminars. And um, and one thing perhaps that hasn't been um, foregrounded enough, I think is how amazing the students are. I think there's a, um, I almost hesitate to say students because it seems to be more a kind of environment of um, mutual exchange. Um, and yeah, that's that's very exciting. I'm really ex proud to be a part of this and and glad to know that it's going so well. So I'm going to say a couple of words about the program first and then about our uh, seminars. The way I conceive it, the art and curatorial practice, well, first of all, I might say that you may have noticed that there's a little bit of a philosophical conspiracy going on. This Everybody wants to do philosophy, but not how it's done in the university. So <laughs> we have our kind of, um, I think it's, it's like a special space of freedom here where, where the boundaries are slightly blurred between what you can and can't do in philosophy, what, what you can and can't consider contemporary as a problem. So uh, that's, that's, that I think is another really special aspect of the new center. So as far as I'm concerned, the art and curatorial practice course is uh, a little bit special because it's not so much, at least it hasn't been in the recent past, about um, looking at art or it's not so much about art as about looking with artists and designers and creative people in the same direction as artists do. Um, and this is, I think, where there's also this uh, strong leaning towards philosophy that's uh, shining through on several occasions. Um, and a special interest in how philosophy relates uh, to contemporary issues, um, notably to uh, philosophy of technology, um, but also the relation between aesthetics, politics, and ethics, um, and how all this enmeshes with creative processes in the context of bigger questions concerning um, issues like uh, global digitization and climate chaos, although this is not especially going to be a topic this semester. Our speakers are often, but not only, philosophers whose work has co-evolved with artists, as was the case with Xiaoxin Wei's popular seminar on topological and metabolic approaches to ontogenesis. They are equally often artists or designers with a philosophical praxis, which is uh, also very exciting, um, and in general, with an eye to the bigger questions concerning, um, you know, uh, I've just re repeated myself, digitization of climate chaos is clearly something that's at the forefront of my mind at the moment. Now, all seminars are grounded in a dialogue with other forms of practices and knowledge. And um, more than anything, I would say, uh, the Art and Curatorial Program is an invitation to think on your feet. Students will meet and become part of a network of professional artists, critics, curators, and thinkers who are currently involved in the fields of art and curation. Um, and by studying in the art and curatorial practice uh, program, students and researchers are able to account uh, for technological transformations um, and the meaning and practice of art in the 21st century and play a role in new possibilities provided by these changes. As part of the practicum, the program includes the publication of research and student curated events and exhibitions. So 
So this brings me to my first introduction of the first seminar is uh, going to be run by Serubiri Moses. Uh, Serubiri is a Ugandan author and curator based in New York City. He's the author of several book chapters translated into five languages, and he's the editor of Forces of Art, Perspectives from a Changing World, published in 2021. He currently serves as faculty in art history at Hunter College, CUNY, and he previously held uh, teaching positions at many um, prestigious institutions like uh, New York University, Center for Cultural Studies, Bard College, and so forth. His project is going to be about um, self-writing, auto-theory, and auto-ethnography, um, based on uh, the Ghanan philosopher Pauline Huntonji and his critique of realism. In this seminar, um, Moses will introduce students to the challenges of developing an auto-theory and auto-ethnography as problem problematized by Pauline Huntonji. Notions of memoir and diaristic writing will be radically challenged uh, in relation to ethnography, psychology, and phenomenology. Cyril Biri's seminar will also ask the following question. If some of the most captivating personalities of today are defined through acts of public speaking and through autobiography, what then can be critically considered as the problems and issues of self-writing, auto-theory, and auto-ethnography? Huntonji's philosophical legacy is going to be foregrounded uh, in uh, its role in understanding African countries formulating their identity after gaining independence and what the Kenyan philosopher Dismas A. Masolo has termed the search for identity. Huntonji's work questions in what ways a practice of self-writing contributes to the rigorous task of thinking about a world amid anti-colonial battles and of thinking belonging in such a world of tensions and anxieties. And what models of self-writing can be viewed as detrimental to the progress or to the process of fulfilling this search for meaning and search for identity. So I'm extremely excited about this. Um, and the second, uh, the second seminar I'm going to introduce is um, one that I have the honor and pleasure of teaching myself. It's going to be on Gilbert Simondon's concept of information. In this seminar, I'm going to look at um, what it is that distinguishes information from a random event. And we'll see why for Simondon, it's the catalyzing effect that an event or singularity has on a process of individuation. Information thus conceived is synonymous with what Simondon calls the sense of individuation in the French uh, sense, le sens de l'individuation, that is its significance, but also its direction of travel. The first part of this survey seminar will consist of situating the key elements of Simondon's conception of information regarding what this curious notion of individuation, which is on the faces of, which is on the face of it, an anachronistic revival of medieval scholastic problems, namely answering the question, what is it that makes a particular entity, an individual, such that its identity is non-transferable to another. This detour is going to allow us to carefully distinguish the concept of individuation from that of mere ontogenesis or the coming about of entities in general. So once we've situated Simondon's conception of information in this problematic of individuation, we can begin to truly grasp the insufficiency that he diagnoses and critiques in the cybernetic concept of information. And in, in the mathematical theory of communication. The second part of the seminar, I'm going to deal with Simondon's critique precisely of this reductive conception of information, which deserves elucidation not only because of a certain blurriness in his own account of cybernetics and information theoretical concepts like information thin entropy and negentropy, but also because the issue of signification does not account exhaustively for Simondon's more substantive approach to information. So that's going to be the seminar on Simondon. Um, then uh, we're going to have two programs also in the work in, in the 
two uh, workshops in the program. And for one, I'm very excited to say that I'll be uh, starting a first collaboration uh, with Lisa Featherstone, an American journalist uh, and journalism professor who writes for On Labor and Student Activism for the Nation and the Jacobin. Uh, this is a two credit long form writing lab um, in which we're going to say uh, work with students on questions like what makes an idea for a writing project, what, ma what makes a good idea for a writing project, how do you move from a curiosity or impulse to an idea, an argument, what would you tell an editor to persuade them to publish, how do you follow through. This is going to be a very hands-on writing lab that aims at supporting a writing project over eight sessions with targeted workshops, prompt writing exercises, and a series of short outside of class assignments. The seminar will culminate in a student's presentation in a student presentation of their drafts that will have been progressively reviewed by fellow students and by us, Lisa and myself. The lab is designed to address the challenges of the writing process from start to finish from developing a robust uh, idea to the formulation of a pitch or proposal, from draft to fully edited submission, um, and is going to be a combination of instruction and discussions, in-session group activities, as well as assignments. So um, this brings me uh, to uh, the last workshop, which is going to be run by Sean Tattle, an art critic whose writing can be found on the website of the Manhattan Art Review. Now, for those who know his style of criticism, I would just like to say that um, our contributors' views are their own. The description of his workshop is the following. In this workshop, Sean will engage participants in the discipline of criticism as a contemporary practice. He'll discuss the qualitative judgment of art as having always been a fraught process, and he'll link the decline of art historical of the art historical canon, as well as of critical and or theoretical discourses to the debilitating rise of social media in order to analyze why the prospect of criticism now seems nearly impossible. But this sense of impossibility and uh, its diagnosis of uh, in effect, or his diagnosis of ineffectual art writing, in fact, will serve him as a basis for the argument that art criticism is, in fact, necessary. The workshop will look at the history of criticism and its usefulness while grappling with the act of criticism in the present. It will discuss the possibilities of a new form of criticism that is informative, articulate, entertaining, and more importantly, brief yet powerful. Finally, I, um, Raphael, you wanted to in introduce, I think, uh, Valentin Golev's uh, seminar, but if uh, if not, I'm happy to do that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I I introduced it uh, at the beginning uh, oh, already, sorry. Uh, alongside the first part. But uh, just uh, circling back to it, perhaps uh, this uh, so this seminar is a is a particularly new initiative that we have thought about uh, on the context of uh, what we see as the increasing uh, the increasing relevance of large language models for knowledge production and research as well. So we, with this workshop, we hope to equip all of the participants without any, and again, without any background in programming or anything, to be able to actually uh, both read these tools critically, so see what these tools are capable of doing and not capable of doing, and then uh, after after doing it, that they can actually use these tools on their favor. So uh, this includes uh, analyzing particular text documents through this tool, producing, using uh, large language models as an aid on translation, editing, and many other text-related uh, text related tasks, and uh, also engaging in a way, uh, producing knowledge about these, uh, these particular tools that actually uh, understand that they are here to stay and that we we must engage with them to actually uh, craft uh, and use them as tools in our practice as writers, artists, curators, and practitioners in general. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm also going to, now that all of the programmers have, uh, have presented a little bit about their lineup and everything, I'm going to go over go over a couple of frequently asked questions. I'd like to, first of all, 
thank all of the programmers that have been here for the presentations and also for all the brain work that goes into curating these seminars and everything. So I really, uh, it's it's always a pleasure to hear about what has been going on on the on the minds of the people who actually crafted the selection of seminars. And uh, now uh, before wrapping up, so I'm going to go over a few frequently asked questions. I know some of the, I have responded to some of to some questions already on the chat, but I will circle back to them because they might be um, somebody else's question as well. So in the beginning, uh, what, one of the questions that appears a lot is uh, what is the space that the certificate program tries to fill in? And uh, I consider I consider that our seminars as graduate level seminars, they are important in the sense that we put people in close contact with scholars and researchers from all around the world. And uh, completing and doing a certificate is actually a very interesting way of uh, transitioning to another area of interest within the humanities or even beyond the humanities, or to open up a, a whole new uh, a whole new agenda of research. For instance, we had uh, people from computer science who wanted to start uh, formulating the implications of what they were actually doing at their work to join the program. And at the same time, we had uh, artists who wanted to have a far like uh, a more solid philosophical grounding to their work. We have had philosophers who actually wanted to get more into art making and actually return to their art practice through the philosophical lenses of everything. So your academic training here becomes quite enhanced and becomes a dialogue uh, in dialogue with other areas of your thinking. So uh, this this has been a particularly interesting thing that we have seen happen to many, many, many of our students. And in terms of the completion of the certificate program, um, completing a certificate program for us means that you have uh, finished the 10 seminar credits. And uh, as you will see on our website, if you look at the seminars page, uh, each uh, seminar credit uh, is a set of four classes. So the seminars uh, actually are uh, converted into credits based on the number of classes that they have. You see that there's one, two, sometimes three, three credit seminars. And uh, the completion means having 10 seminar credits completed, which usually we forecast that you're going to be organizing this during your fir the first year of your studies. And then during the second year, you would be focusing on your on the your final work and on making consultancies with your programmer and advancing your research. So this is pretty much the anatomy, the ideal anatomy of it. Of course, a lot of the times uh, there there may be different distributions of this. Some people have uh, during their for and by when I say first year, it's important to say that I, I don't mean like you join in one season. You join on spring summer. That means you have. Uh, until the beginning of, uh, you have spring, summer 2024, plus the seminars from fall, winter 2024, 2025 to complete your credit. So you actually have two seasons within the year. And uh, yeah, so there's plenty of time. And also you're not limited by any amount of, I can only take 10 credits or, or anything, but actually you can take more than the required number of credits and everything. And of course, as a member, you also have access to our entire archive, which contains the 10 years of our history as uh, and everything that has uh, ever happened within the new center in the context of a seminar is available over there, including for most of them, the materials, uh, some of the discussions that happened. So it really functions as an archive of uh, many years of thought being developed around the institution. Uh, yes, basically as a, Student, the only mandatory thing on your choice of seminars is on the first semester and on the on, like on your first two semesters, your first two seasons that you take the seminar with your uh, programmer or like at least two two credits within your like the the program that you applied in. But the rest is completely open, so this gives you plenty of time to actually bridge to other areas, learn more about. Uh, about anything else that you might be interested in and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of people are, wor are worried about the time balance and how do people usually conciliate uh, the new center with their current uh, work practice and activities and everything. Uh, I should say that uh, 
This depends a lot on a case by case uh, basis. We did have students who are in between degrees. We had people at some point who were uh, had other part time or full time jobs in universities and everything. But uh, we tend to be uh, to make ourselves as flexible as possible with the pace of uh, fulfilling the requirements and uh, considering that it spans through two seasons. As I said, it, it's quite manageable. And uh, still, worst case scenario, we have some room to maneuver and we can take uh, a few credits during the second year where you would be focusing on your final work and so on. So we try to be as flexible as possible because we know that uh, many of these people have, uh, many of you who are applying have many different responsibilities and everything. So we do our best to analyze uh, everything on a case by case basis. And uh, in terms of the scholarship uh, eligibility and uh, application documents, uh, this is this is one thing that I wanted to reiterate. Although we said that we give uh, partial and full scholarships and that we have already uh, the partial scholarships for Global South students start at 50%, there's nothing really that keeps students from the Global North who have a particular uh, difficult financial situation of actually getting even a full scholarship or more than a 50% scholarship. We are very open to these cases as well. And uh, this is why on the application, we include, we ask you to include both a uh, letter of an, uh, a writing sample, which showcases basically uh, what ideas are being interested uh, interesting to you, and also a letter of intent, which showcases your need for financial support and so on and so forth. And uh, for the writing sample, uh, we do not really have a constraint in terms of the size. Uh, what I usually personally recommend from my experience is to send a smaller document of 1,000 to 1,500 words, which could be a part of a published or a non-published text. If you believe that it displays both your writing skills and also a at least a little bit about your interests and what you're interested in and what type of uh, type of knowledge you're you're trying you're trying to focus on producing on your time at the new center but we understand that sometimes of course it's never going to our interests develop over time so it's never going to be a hundred percent fitting uh, and that's why we also have the interview where you talk to our admissions officer and you can speak more about what you're interested in and how you found out about the new center and what parts of it are are more important to you and uh, I think that is it from I'm just gonna I'm just gonna address quickly a question that uh, was uh, on the on the chat. We tend to yeah, about the program. Some people are asking about the constraints about uh, picking a program or not if they can apply for more than one program uh, in case there are no scholarships available or anything. Uh, we usually, uh, as, although on the form you're only going to see one, uh, you can only opt for one program. This is something that can be talked about during the process. If you decide to apply for other program during the process of application, even a little bit afterwards, uh, as long as your seminar, uh, seminar choices reflect that, uh, it, it is fine. It's something that can be treated also as uh, on a case-by-case -case basis as well. I'm going to put here on the on the chat the email where you can, uh, if you have any other follow-up questions, uh, you can send your email to. Uh, I'm the student services responsible, so I'll be talking to you over there as well. And if you have any uh, questions, be watching the recording or uh, right now, uh, please send them to, to us and we will respond to them as quickly as possible. So Liam, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Raphael, and thank you uh, to all of our programmers. This seems like a super uh, lineup of seminars. I'm uh, excited uh, to, to listen in and uh, watch a lot of them. And uh, thank you uh, to our viewers for your time and attention, and we look forward to seeing you in the upcoming season. Yes. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.